memory works. And the things that we recall from our youth, there are specific moments in history that I remember with crystal clear clarity as if they just happened yesterday. If there are any younger uh, listeners, that's something that you're going to discover more and more as you get older. It's, it's kind of fascinating when I look back and I think about how many historical events I've lived through at this point. Um, and <laughs> not, not every one of these moments is something huge and massive and world-altering, but they do leave an indelible impression. I will always remember where I was when I discovered that they were making another Police Academy movie. I, let me paint a picture. So my parents and I, we were on vacation. We were in Seattle, I believe. And I was in a Warner Brothers store, which there are those of you who are going to be going, what's that? And the closest thing I can compare it to, you will also be saying, what's that? Because they're not around anymore. But it was basically a Disney store for Warner Brothers stuff. It was exactly the same concept. And as part of the almost identical layout, they had in the uh, in the store, in the center of it, a giant projection screen that would show upcoming events and things that Warner Brothers was getting ready to do. I mean, the whole place was designed to, you know, make money off of their IP and to get you interested in new IP. And for instance, it was at a Warner Brothers store that I first heard about uh, the creation of Batman Beyond. That would be a different Warner Brothers store uh, a couple years later. However, I digress. So I'm in the Warner Brothers store. I was looking at a Daffy Duck shirt. And suddenly, on this projection screen, there came an advertisement for Police Academy Mission to Moscow. Now, by this time, so this this was in 1993, I believe, or 1992, because it was prior to the film coming out, and it was released in 93, so I can't remember exactly what year it was, but... My time as a devoted Police Academy fan had had been done. I was not a kid anymore. I was in my early teens. I was on the verge of heading into uh, heading into high school. Actually, no, I'd be I would be in middle school at the time. So, but you know, you had kind of shed those those things that you loved so much as a kid when you reevaluated them and you moved on to more mature fare. And as devoted a fan as I was to the original series when it was out and when I had viewed it as a youngster, even three short years from when the first, the last movie, when Under, uh, City Under Siege came out to now, the world had changed drastically. And we're going to talk about that in a second. And my attitudes had changed drastically. And my my immediate reaction was, oh my God, they're doing another one of those stupid things. I know, I know. I was a jaded, uh, a jaded young man. And now this was the same jaded young man who claimed he hated the Adam West Batman show. And now I would probably count it among one of my favorite TV shows of all time. So, you know, I was, I was young. But anyway, um, and that seemed to be the reaction of just about everyone. Um, this movie is not well remembered. It is not looked upon fondly. And it is barely mentioned when the Police Academy series is brought up. Now, granted, the Police Academy series is not usually the topic of a lot of debate and discussion, 
but, you know, there are still fans, but most people kind of believe, like I put forth last time, that the series ended with uh, City Under Siege properly, and that this coming back was not something anybody had asked for and not something anybody had wanted, and audiences stayed away in droves. I don't even remember getting a theatrical release. I remember seeing the trailer, and I remember uh, a short time later, it was suddenly on TV, and you could see it at uh, the local video store. So I don't know how much of a theatrical release it actually got, but people stayed away. Um, so the question you may be asking yourself is, why then am I going to cover this movie, especially because to do so, I have to journey outside of the decade that I had set up this series to specifically look at. We have to travel into the 90s to talk about this film. Well, the reasons why are because I had set out to look at this entire franchise. I wanted to look at it from start to finish. I wanted to evaluate it for all its flaws and all its uh, all its pedigree and all its benefits. I wanted to see it warts and all. There was even a part of me that thought about trying to get a hold of the animated series and the TV series and even talk about those, but I've decided not to do that. So, I, I was already kind of dedicated to, to doing this as a mission statement for what I want to do with the rest of this series. The other reason is because, as I have already discovered, is that time makes fools of us all, and time also gives us a certain amount of wisdom and hindsight. I've mentioned this multiple times, but I hadn't given any of these movies any thought for decades. And the decision to go back and rewatch them was one of wanting to rediscover what it was about them I loved so much as a kid. And I have to say that having done that, and we'll talk about this a bit more in the wrap up, that. I do still have a soft spot for these movies, and there's still a lot of good in them and a lot of enjoyable times in them. So I had to kind of try to give that same opportunity to all of the movies to see if they were going to all have that effect. Let me use another example of a very similar series, um, the Rocky series, one of the greatest film series of all time, in my opinion, and how very few people really remember Rocky V. There's not a lot that people remember, and the ones that do don't really remember it fondly. But I have rewatched it, and must say that it actually is good. It's not the best of them, but it certainly has an interesting arc for the character, and it certainly comes at the story from a new way. There are benefits to it. So just because something got panned and dismissed doesn't mean it is completely without merit. So I wanted to look at this film to complete the series and also to answer the question, is this movie really as bad as people say it is. Does it deserve the reputation that it has? Or doesn't have? Because this movie really doesn't have a reputation. Nobody talks about this movie. Ever. So, does this movie deserve that? Or is this a diamond in the rough? Are there elements of this that deserve to be looked at and reevaluated so many years later? So, for one time only, I believe, we are going to journey into the future, into the 90s, to take a look at the real final entry in the Police Academy saga, that being Police Academy 
mission to Moscow and find out for ourselves, is it really that bad? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I am going to just spoil this for you right now. Is this movie that bad? Yes, it is that fucking bad. And it is worse than, than that. This movie is painful. It hurt to watch this. It physically hurt. The other Police Academy movies, especially when you go further back, I mean, we did a whole section on how offended should I be for a lot of them. Yeah, there were some cringy moments, and there were some things in them that made me uncomfortable, and that you look back on and go, oh, God. But they still had their benefits, they still had their upsides, they still had their qualities. This movie is an abomination. This is going to be something that we're not going to do a lot with this series. If I select a movie to be a part of this series, it's usually because I've seen it before. I have some idea of its quality and either I am trying to reevaluate it and say, was I right in my original opinions, right or wrong? You're not going to hear a lot of these takedowns and just rants about how fucking horrible this is. Unless, you know, this gets a ton of views or a ton of listens and people love it, then yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it all day long. That is the you know, the nature of my existence, I'll tell you that. Um, but, but I have next to nothing nice to say about this movie. This movie baffles me. It baffles me from start to finish. Before we get into that, let's talk about what is the plot of this film. So, now in 1993, well away from the heyday of the Police Academy movies, um, a Russian gangster has released a new video game that has become the most sweeping phenomenon in video game history. You can tell this movie itself, you can see how dated it is by the opening uh, exposition dump being done on a news show and talking about how this video game has captured the mind of not just kids, but adults. <laughs> like, anybody watching this movie who was born in, like, the, the, the 2000s and beyond are not going to understand that. But, yeah, there was a time, kids, when video games were just for kids. You know, we have quote-unquote adults now who dedicate their lives to doing nothing but sitting online and playing video games for hours on end. But back in the day, that was not the case. So, so yeah, but that's... So, anyway. Uh, so, yes, they know it's been made by this Russian mobster. It's not even a secret. Um, but the Russian police are having so much trouble dealing with him that they call in Commandant Lassard, who apparently this Russian gangster had come to America, tried to set up a business. Lassard had thwarted him, but he had escaped back to Russia before they could arrest him. So Lassard gets together a team to go after him. Well, this sounds exciting, doesn't it? Well, put those expectations away, because... <laughs> This should be the first warning sign of just how, how, what kind of a journey we are in for. The One of the staples of the Police Academy movies have always been its large ensemble cast. A dozen or more um, central characters who share the load and um, give us all these wonderful little comedy vignettes. We are down to three. We are down to three. Jones, Tackleberry, and now Captain Callahan. Along with um, Lassard and Captain Harris, who is back at the police academy, 
So I guess that whole thing about having his own precinct didn't work out. He must have gotten bumped down after the events of City Under Siege. Uh, he also is now a surveillance expert. I don't know when that happened or when we have seen any evidence of that prior, but I guess that's why he's going along on this. We are missing so many important pieces. There is no high tower. There is no hooks. There's no proctor. There is no no uh, Nick Lassard. There's no Mahoney. There's no Zed. There's no Sweet Chick. There's no House. None of these endearing characters. We have just these three. Now, on the surface, that sounds like a fantastic, or not so much a fantastic, but not so much of a bad idea. By spreading it out, it means that now these characters who have always kind of been regulated to kind of sharing the spotlight, so to speak, might get to branch out and have more of the story focus on them, right? Well, wrong. Or I'd say 75% wrong, or 50% wrong. One character does get a, uh, a bit of a push. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but the majority of the action is now following a new character, a new cadet. Cadet Connors, played by Charlie Schlatter, who, and let's be very clear about this, and I want to make it clear I'm talking about the character, Cadet Connors is, and again, I want to be clear about this, a massive fucking prat. This is one of the most unlikable, uninteresting characters ever to be pushed to the forefront and made into the lead of a movie. And he is the lead. He is our new, trying to be our new Mahoney. But he is no Mahoney. I am so sorry, Steve Gutenberg. I am so sorry, Mahoney. Please come back. All is forgiven. I would have given anything to have Mahoney back in this instead of this fucking guy. He is irritating to a point of nausea. And the actor is not a bad actor. He's had a very um, long-running career, mostly as a voiceover actor. He has played The Flash in a variety of DC animated movies. And he's done a lot of other voice work. So it's not that the actor is bad. I think the actor at the time was young and inexperienced in having an entire movie kind of rest on his shoulders. And let's be fair, the writing and directing did him no favors. This is... This movie is okay. I'm just I'm just running out of I'm running off the top of my head here because there's just so much to cover. Um, let's back up. We need to back up in this and just talk about what went wrong here. What fucking happened? Um, and a lot fucking happened. Okay. We I, I mentioned this before. Now let's talk about it. I have said back in the very first episode of this series that you know the first couple decade first couple years of a new decade tend to be just the previous decade with some new flavor you know things are fading you know new ideas are taking shape new concepts are coming forward and it takes a little bit for the last remnants of the previous decade to kind of fall away and that tends to be true. But I was there, guys, and I don't know if it's just me or if anybody else feels like this, but it feels like the 90s happened almost overnight or maybe over the course of one very important year, 1991, where social and political elements all shifted and it seemed like people just suddenly see the world in a much different light 
the difference between 1989 when the last Police Academy movie came out and 1993, it might as well be different centuries. Okay? So, you know, I, I don't like this idea that one thing happened, but the music industry will always point to 1991 because that is the year that Nirvana dropped their Nevermind album and completely changed the landscape. Now, I don't believe one album really did all that. I think there were other factors, and it's kind of the catalyst for it all. But it serves as a great visual metaphor that the 90s hit, and it, like, almost instantaneously everything, our outlook, our political stance, everything changed. The Berlin Wall came down in 1989. The Cold War officially ends in 91. So another important date in 91. There's another one we're going to talk about here in a second. So the, the time when Police Academy was relevant and the time when it was made was long dead. And that's something we're going to find that's not just a problem with Police Academy. That's one of the reasons I am looking at the 80s as a solid decade and their films is because a lot of these movies could only be made in that very specific 10-year span. The ideology, the, um, the, the outlook, the attitude... It was all very different in the 80s, and the, the minute the 90s hit, everything got turned on its ear. So this is not a, a problem unique to the Police Academy movies, but it does explain why these films, when it turns out there was going to be another one, why so many audiences just groaned at the possibility, because those movies weren't of the time anymore. They just weren't. They were a cute remnant of a simpler era that maybe we still caught on TNT and TBS once in a while and maybe HBO, but that for the most part were gone. And that even would not have been a death blow in and of itself if they were attempting to remake the Police Academy franchise, or I guess using more modern terminology, reboot it to fit 90s, um, 90s outlooks. But that's not what they did. This movie is some bizarre in-between area between the Police Academy that was and the movies that were popular at the, at the now. And it didn't hit anywhere. The question you had to ask is, who was this for? Who, who was writing this? Because it felt like whoever was had no idea of what made Police Academy work or who these characters were or what was endearing about them. Any and all endearing qualities that I have spent the last however many reviews going over and praising they were gone now. The, the characters who had their charms and their wits, they were dead and gone. And what was left were these unrecognizable husks that bore the same name. Harris, who I praised, praised for being the backbone of this entire series, of being the reason it was so successful. He's just a fucking idiot now. Just a fucking idiot. Like, and without a, an even bigger idiot like a Proctor to bounce off of, he, he really is just wandering around. And that's something that I feel like a lot of the actors are doing this. Just wandering around looking for something to do? Am I, should I do this? Is this funny? What's this? The, there's a lot of shit with like, they take the physical comedy, which has always been a little on the cartoonish side. That's always been where Police Academy's uh, sweet spot kind of lay is right in that 
live action cartoon kind of mold. And they have turned that up. There are so many jokes or physical gags where the characters do backflips or flip up in the air like freaking ninjas and land that it it's it's ridiculous. Characters for whom this was never a thing. There's a scene, we're gonna talk about this in a minute. This is really important. Um, where they tour the Moscow Police Academy and Tackleberry is called up on stage to discuss American uh, crime solving or, yeah, uh, cri uh, law enforcement, that's the word, law enforcement techniques. So he's running down, somebody sticks their leg out, he trips, he does a triple backflip in the air and lands on his feet. Nothing in Tackleberry's history says that he would do that. That, that Now, if Jones did it, maybe you could have gotten away with it. But Tackleberry, that's never been his thing, ever. And the scene gets worse. Okay, this is, we got to talk about this because this is really important. Um, and this goes into this movie being completely tone deaf as to the world it's coming into existence in and the characters that it is now completely fucking over. So in this talk to this Moscow Police Academy, Tackleberry goes on this monologue about how new regulations being handed down are handcuffing them and tying their hands. They can't use a chokehold anymore. And he demonstrates on Harris. He can't use a nightstick because that's excessive force and police brutality. And he, you know, he does it with this whole, like, it's a bad thing. You know what else happened in uh, 1991? Rodney King happened in 1991. The L.A. riots followed after the trial where all the officers who beat this man within an inch of his life all got off. The L.A. riots happened in 1992. And then here comes this film saying that, oh, don't, don't come down on cops. Don't be mean to us. We're just trying to uphold the law. For six movies, Tackleberry, overzealous, yes. Um, loves his guns, yes. Um, has a bit of an issue with uh, picturing himself as a little kid playing cops and robbers, Yes, but throughout what made it work is that at no time did you ever get the feeling that Tackleberry was in any way cruel or that he was in any way working out power fantasies or um, attempting to um, yield his power or have his power loom over those less fortunate than him. He was not a bully, ever. And you see this. This is one of the defining aspects of his character. This is why we loved him so much. This is why Tackleberry was such a beloved character. Is because you could see the little kid in him. He wanted to do right. As overzealous and as fond of his weapons as he was, he wasn't a bad person. This kind of talk feels like it should be coming from, you know, Banks, or Blanks, I'm sorry, or Copeland from the first movie. Like, that was their thing. They were the bullies. They were the power trips. Tackleberry never had that. And I especially think that it sounds weird to say, like, how would these fictional characters, especially ones that exist in such a cartoony reality, how they would um, react to a real-world situation. I do not think that Tackleberry would be on those other cops' side at all. I don't think that for a second. He was too much of, a, of an innocent. And he had too many friends and came f and worked too much in neighborhoods with people like that to believe that a criminal 
or someone just being arrested, not even a criminal, deserve to be brutalized in that way. And whether the, I don't believe for a second this film is trying to make a political statement. I don't think this film is smart enough to try to make a political statement. I think what they're trying to do is do a bit where Tackleberry was just trying to find excuses to beat up Harris, but it handles it so incompetently that it feels like it's trying to say more than it meant to. And it just shows the extreme tone deafness, not just to the character it has been entrusted with that it is now bastardizing, but to the real world where real issues are coming into play and are finally being discussed and are finally getting worldwide attention and you're making it out like the cops were perfectly perfectly uh, justified in their action. That just shows how stupid everyone involved with this movie was. Gnarly. The two words I would use to describe this movie most are cheap and incompetent. As I mentioned, it feels like a direct-to-video sequel, but from what I understand, it was released in theaters. But you never know it from the production values. I, I assume it looks like they actually did film chunks of it in Moscow, in Russia. So maybe that's where the budget went. Because the rest of it is just, it is so secondhand. Let me give you a couple examples. So, first of all, when we get our first exterior shot of the police academy, we're not at the glorious one from the original couple of films. We're at the cheap pink building from Police Academy 5. But, and I am almost 100% positive on this, I didn't compare the two, but I am almost 100% sure that it's actually just the footage of the exterior from Police Academy 5. It doesn't even look like they went and got the actual building again. And then when we go inside, where we're in Lassard's office, his office has gone from this grand, what you would assume the headmaster or commandant of a police academy, you know, what their office would look like. He's gone from the familiar surroundings we've seen in all the other movies to a small pink, or actually I think the, room, the walls are actually green now on the inside. It looks like they're filming in a cardboard box. Okay. You know, I can understand that. Okay, I'm going to forgive that. Again, I believe they did film a lot of this in, in Russia, so that's not, an ex that's not a cheap trip for a film crew. Got to cut corners. Okay, I get that. What I can't forgive is the props that they use for the game, the evil villain's uh, mastermind uh, video game that appeals to both youngsters and adults, or more so those with more sophisticated minds, as they said. Um, it's a fucking Game Boy. It is a fucking Game Boy. They do nothing to disguise the fact that it is a Game Boy, except they very rarely show it from the front, so they're always shooting it from the back, so I guess so you don't see the logo. Okay, fair enough, but here's the thing, in half the shots where someone is playing this thing, there's no fucking cartridge in the back. It's just this blank space where the game cartridge would have gone, and you're already being very distracting by having it clearly be a Game Boy. You're making it even more distracting by not having a game in the slot where the game would go on the Game Boy. People are going to notice this. And I would even accept it if it was a consistent choice. But sometimes they do have a cartridge in the back. And then sometimes they don't. It's This is not difficult shit. And here's the real kicker. At the end of the film, when they stop the mass production of The Game 2, we're going to talk about uh, the evil plot here in a minute. Um, 
but when they stop the mass production and they hold up the box that the game comes in, they couldn't even come up with a name for it. It's not, it, there's no great name. It's just the game. Like that uh, I thing from Star Trek The Next Generation. Anyway, when they hold up the box, it's a fucking Game Boy box. Like the, the graphics and the, the design are the fucking original Game Boy box. No attempt has been made to disguise this except it says the game on the box. So clearly they hired someone to create a false front for this box and said, just put the game on it. Don't change anything else. You couldn't fucking, you know, redesign it. You couldn't pay these people an extra 20 bucks and have them come up with something that looked different from the Game Boy. Seriously? Like, I... It, oh, my God. But here's what's really mind-boggling about all this. Is that while every bit of the production of this movie looks cheap and lazy. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me back up for a second. Another thing. Remember how I talked about the weird flips, the back flips, and the uh, the falling and all that that they do in this? I talked about it with Tackleberry. The way it is shot, I had to, my last year as a high school theater teacher, because it was the year after the lockdown, we couldn't do a full-on production. So we made a movie, which you can find on my YouTube channel, if you're interested. And it looks exactly like you think it would look from a teacher and a bunch of students making a movie. You know, it, it, there's no budget. There is no, like, the cuts and everything are so amateurish. But for what it is, I think it came out looking pretty good. For what it is. Like, is it as good as Clerks? Hell no. But I would say it's definitely better than this shit. I swear, the way they film the people doing the flips and landing, cutting between the stunt doubles and the actual person or the wire work or whatever, and then having them land, it's like, it, it's cut together so fake. The movie I made with my students should not look better than an actual Hollywood film with experienced filmmakers. That shouldn't happen. Anyway, back on track. The one place that this film does not cut its corners, which is very surprising, is in its cast. Now, yes, uh, a lot of our stalwarts and our regulars are gone. I'm assuming that by this point they were all tired of it or they read the script and said, no way in hell. Um... And I get the feeling from the complete lack of interest that the other actors are showing that this is, in every way, shape, and form, a paycheck deal for them or a way to get a free vacation. And I don't blame them for that. That's not a criticism. I, you know, I like I said, you you go where the money is. But this film actually boasts a pretty impressive pedigree of actors. So. In our main cast, yes, we've got our returnings. We've got George Gaines. We've got uh, Leslie Easterbrook, Michael Winslow, David Graff, uh, uh, D.A. D.W. Uh, sorry, <laughs> um, Harris. I knew his name throughout this entire review, and the minute I go to say it, it goes out of my head. But you know who I'm talking about. So we got all of them. Um, Charlie Charlie Chuller, who again played Connors. The character is awful, but he had a decent career. He was young and up and coming, so not bad. And like I said, he had a a pretty good career as a voice actor. But this seems to be a theme for this movie because another one of the major characters, um, Lieutenant Talski, who who I feel like they were trying to make the fill in for Proctor and kind of make the a foil for Harris, didn't work. But I think that's what they were trying to do with him. Uh, is played by veteran voice actor Greg Berger, who you may not know the name and you may not know him by sight, but if you were a kid in the 80s or the 90s, you know his voice. 
he is a very, very sought after uh, voice actor. Uh, has a thing for doing the voice of pigs. He was the voice of Orson for Garfield and Friends and Corn Fed in the 90s uh, adult animated series Duckman. But more famously, he was the voice of several characters on the original Generation 1 Transformers. Most famously, he is the iconic voice of Grimlock. Yes, Grimlock. King of the Dinobots is, is in this fucking movie. So you got them. You also have, as the Russian mobster, Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman. Vincent from Beauty and the Beast. Fucking Hellboy. Now, granted, this is prior to Hellboy. I get that, but it's Ron fucking Perlman. Holy shit, and I'm not surprised he's in this. He's a character actor, and, you know, this is before he was Ron Perlman. So, yeah, you, you go where you, where you can. So, I don't, again, I'm not surprised. What I am surprised by is the guy playing, like, the commandant of the Russian police force, Christopher fucking Lee. Christopher Fucking Lee. Look, again, I get it. You know, especially with British and European actors, they take any role and they play it all with the same gusto and professionalism that they would if they were playing the lead in a Shakespeare play. It's one of the things I love about British and European trained actors. Because they look at it as, it's my job, and I'm going to do the very best that I can. Alright? And it's not like Christopher Lee had never done a bad movie prior to this. Or a goofy movie prior to this. Or after this. I mean, he made his name in, you know, some Splatterhouse Dracula movies. He was in Gremlins 2. You know, so it's not that it's weird that he's in this. But it is weird that he's fucking in this. How, in a movie this cheap, this awful, did you get Christopher Lee? Did he owe the director a favor? Did he donate a kidney to him? How? How did this happen? I am flabbergasted when he showed up. I'm like, again, I can only assume he must have known somebody in the crew who said, will you come and do this with us? And he was like, yeah. Or, like I said, they offered him the trip, you know, a free trip to Russia, a free vacation. He was like, oh, I'm only in the movie for 10 minutes. Yeah, sure, why not? You know, who knows? But still, Christopher fucking Lee, you know, fucking Saruman, fucking Count Dooku. Oh, okay. You know, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> Red. Now, in the interest of being fair and even-handed, in the interest of uh, giving this movie its due credit, I have to say that there are four, exactly four elements of this movie that, at least in theory, on paper are good ideas. I'm not going to say that they work because almost to a one, they present this idea, this joke, or this concept, and then fuck it up. Or it flies in the face of things we've already established. But, as concepts, as things that could have worked in better movies, <clears throat> these were not bad things. So I, I want to count these down and then show you how they fucked them up. So, first um, is Jones getting hit in the head with a piece of chalk. So during the mission briefing, um, Christopher Lee is up at the chalkboard and he's underlining things with the chalkboard and of course Jones is doing what Jones does and making an obnoxious you know, chalk scratching noise 
on the uh, on the chalkboard, or to make it sound like it's coming from the chalkboard. Christopher Lee puts up with this twice and then chucks the chalk at him and smacks him in the head. And this joke, to me, while I won't say I laughed, I will say it worked. And it was one of the better parts of the movie. Because it builds on things we've already established. This is one of the things Jones has done to just about everybody. Whether he likes them or not, he'll always make some noise when they do something, you know, to get a laugh from the room. And it's in, so we, the audience, already know this. And it's something we've never seen anybody do, react to him in that way. And again, it builds on this idea that if you're going to try to bring this series into the next decade, you have to acknowledge some of the aspects of it from the past, but not fall into the trap of letting those play out exactly the same way as they did. I mentioned it in one of the other reviews that, you know, you have to suspend your disbelief a lot with any movie, but especially with these films and especially with Jones, that his whole shtick is making these uh, sound effects, but that people can't tell where the voice is coming from. They can't tell that that sound of someone chewing is coming from across the room and not right across from you, you know? So having somebody automatically call him out on it and respond in a way we've never seen someone respond, that actually is smart. That works. It would have been a good way to blend the the expectations of the series in with uh, where the series is going to go now. But then they instantly, instantly undercut it. Because while he's doing that, Harris is G.W. Bailey. That's the guy's name. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, anyway, um, G.W. Bailey is supposedly looking for bugs throughout the room, and he's bending over, and he rips a fart. Now, I think, and again, this shows how incompetent the film is, I think that it was supposed to be Jones making the fart noise so everybody laughed at Harris. Because Harris doesn't react to it. And, you know, I don't know about anybody else, I feel it when I fart. You know, it's not one of those things that you're like, whoa, was that me? You know? Um, but he doesn't react to it at all. He just, you know, he just is over in the corner doing shit looking lost, which is what all of them do throughout most of the movie. And he does this, everybody laughs, and uh, yeah, it's like, was that Jones? Was that him actually farting? Either way, the joke doesn't work. So you start out with something smart and then immediately undercut it. Okay? So that's one. Number two, one of the running jokes of this movie is that they arrive in Russia, they tell Commandant Lassard, your car is waiting for you out front. Okay? So he goes out, and there's a funeral procession picking up a body at the airport, and he mistakes the front of the funeral procession for his car. He gets in, and he ends up going with the family to the funeral, and then basically being adopted by this Russian family throughout the course of the movie. Okay, that's kind of cute. That's kind of a funny idea, and, you know, with Lassard, that's exactly the kind of thing that would happen to him. This is a guy who was kidnapped and didn't realize it. You know, so... But, again, this idea falls flat for a number of reasons. Number one, because it seems like Lassard completely forgets why he's in Russia and is just kind of wandering around with his family, aimless. He comes back at the end to save the day. But it's like, it'd be funnier if he was trying to communicate with them, trying to figure out how to find the police, you know, or somehow through them he solves the crime. But no, he's just wandering around, killing time. It also leads to the stupidest running gag in the entire uh, in the entire film. Because they have lost Lassard, Greg Berger's uh, character hires a bellhop at the hotel to stay in Lassard's room and anytime someone comes and knocks on the door to say, I'm in the bathroom, I'll be there later. So for the entire film, 
these people who have worked with Lassard for over seven years now don't realize that this is not, in fact, his voice, but someone with a very thick Russian accent or a very bad Russian accent. Again, there's there's willing suspension of disbelief that Jones's voice can come from anywhere and nobody really knows it. And there's completely undermining the audience's intelligence, like believing that by the time Police Academy 4 rolls around, Harris would do anything that Mahoney told him to. So this is the latter. So there's that. The one plot that they don't mess up, except for the fact that the whole movie messes it up. So, but the the thing, one of the other things that's good about this movie, so this is number three, is the villain's plan. Ron Perlman's plan is actually kind of smart, and is strangely, I, I I forget the word, prolific. You know, whatever it is, when it's going to predict what's going to happen uh, years in the future. So his evil plan is he designed this video game, he releases it, it becomes this huge hit, and there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing evil about it. It's just a video game. It's just a very addictive, very appealing video game. It's when he plans to release the second one that he's going to include a computer virus or whatever that will then hack into people's computers when they upload it or whatever and allow him to take over the world or whatever. But that's actually kind of a clever plan. And again, one that predicts the way technology is going to operate in the future. Imagine if someone used that kind of plot now. You release a piece of technology, an app, or a, or a cell phone or something. Everybody has to have it. It's ingrained in your life. It's a necessary tool or one that you feel is necessary because when you're cut off from it, you feel like you're on a desert island and there's nothing wrong with it, but then the second one comes out and that's the one that fucks you up. That's actually clever. I think that was actually a pretty clever plan. Uh, just It had a shitty movie to support it. Lastly, so the other thing that it kind of gets right, as I mentioned before, is that it wouldn't have been so bad to have such a small group of returning characters if it meant that they got to expand and do more and build on their characters, which they really didn't have the opportunity to do when it was a larger ensemble piece. For the most part, that does not happen. The characters are playing second fiddle, you know, Jones, Tackleberry, and Callahan are pretty much playing second fiddle to Cadet Connors for some reason. Until we get about two-thirds of the way in, and they set up an undercover mission at this casino that Ron Perlman goes to, and Callahan goes undercover as a lounge singer who seduces Ron Perlman to, you know, bring him down. Okay, that's great. It showcases some of Leslie Estabrook's other talents. We talked about her being a Broadway, uh, a Broadway actor and a singer, so it got her to bring that in, which we've never really seen except in the musical number in uh, number three. And it gives her something else to do. She has, she's actually actively participating in the investigation, which she really hasn't done a lot in the previous films. So, so okay, that's good, right? Well, here's what happens then. So then, um, leading into the climax, Ron Perlman's goons kidnap Callahan, take her to his uh, to his home, where she's dressed in a very I'm just gonna say it a very sexy outfit. She, she's in a very she's a very attractive woman, and she looks very good in the outfit. Not gonna lie. Uh, she's tied up on his bed, and he's making all of these creepy advances towards her. Now, they try to play it off like kind of like that scene in the Avengers where uh, Black Widow is tied to the chair and the bad guys think they have the jump on her, but she's really uh, working them and then she kicks all of their asses. It's kind of a proto-plasmic um, 
not protoplasmic, that's the wrong adjective. Um, kind of a primordial version of that scene. But it plays completely different. Even that scene plays very different now that we know a little bit more about Joss Wheat. But anyway, um, it doesn't play like that. First of all, it's two actors doing very bad comedy. And that makes the scene awkward in and of itself. So they're struggling to find chemistry with each other, which they don't really have. And, again, I know that in the end she rescues herself. She's playing possum and she gets untied and beats up his bat, his henchman and gets her uniform back on. But this is exactly like what I was talking about with Tackleberry. That this is a character that throughout the entire six series of this film, of this film has always been portrayed as completely in control of her sexuality. Yes, she was there for the male gaze, but she was the boss. She was in charge. And even with what they were trying to do, I know what they were attempting, but it doesn't work. Dressing her the way they do, having her in the position that she's in, the bad dialogue, the lack of chemistry, it comes off very skeezy and it comes off as really disempowering this very, very powerful female character. This is the first time I feel, and I, I, I know that I'm a white, straight man making this statement, so I know it's very ballsy of me to say this. So I would love to hear the female perspective. Um, but this is the first time to me that it really felt like Callahan was being objectified in this series. So, yeah. So there you have it. Four possibly good ideas or decent moments that somehow this film found a way to fuck up. Okay, so that's that's everything I can talk about. There should let me just be crystal clear here people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to end it like this, but this movie is as bad as advertised. This movie is awful. There is absolutely no legitimate reason for anybody to watch this movie ever. Unless you're doing like I'm doing and you're watching a whole series and you feel like you know, you have to do this one just because it's, you know, it's on the checklist. But honestly, I I don't think that's necessary. I think if that's where you're coming from, stop where the series was still the series. This limp attempt, and again, I don't know what they were trying to do. I don't know who thought this was a good idea. I don't know... Who thought the Police Academy brand was still going to fly? Apparently somebody, because uh, a few years later, that's when the live-action Police Academy TV series came out. Lasted for, I think, a season, maybe two, and quietly died. Because I think it was on Fox, which that's very much their M.O. Um, but, like, there's no reason this movie needed to exist no reason this movie needed to exist. It, it's a, it brings down its own franchise, which, you know, as much as I've enjoyed going back over them, it's not like the franchise was something really powerful like the Lord of the Rings or the MCU or, you know, or the Harry Potter franchise to begin with. So there is absolutely no reason to go back and watch this movie unless you really want to see how bad a movie can be. Actually, that is a good reason. That is a very good reason to go watch this movie. If you're a film student or a theater student or a directing student, go watch this movie to see just how not to do something. You know, lesson number one should be don't do this. So, um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's my take on Mission to Moscow. Um, and it's sad to me that that's how it's going to end that's how the series, but I think everybody got a good send-off in part six. A lot of the characters and actors do come back to do guest stars on the television series, so yeah. So while this is where the Police Academy series ends, it's not quite where our look 
back at the series ends. Before we move on, uh, before we go to the next film, which I want to talk about here in a second, um, I do want to say that I want to do a wrap-up of these films and my thoughts on them as a series, as a franchise. Um, things I've touched on as we've been going through, but that I want to kind of wrap up and see kind of where my original thesis statements uh, ended up. Why are these movies so endearing? Is there anything still worthwhile in them? And uh, I, I don't want to do that here. So what I'm going to do is there'll be a, a mini episode released kind of with this one where we will wrap up the Police Academy series before moving on to our next 80s film. On that, before I go, one last thing. If you've been enjoying these and I've been enjoying making them, um, I would very much like to know what 80s movie would you like to see covered on this show? I know, I think I know which one I'm going to go to next, but I've got a long list of films I want to get to, and I'm interested to know kind of which ones people are really interested in hearing about. So if you go to the Drive Home Reviews Facebook page, you'll find a link to a survey that asks, what would you like? So if you're interested in having your voice heard, you want to have a say in kind of where we go next and what we look at, uh, go check that out and let me know. So that is, that's all I've got for this one. So thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for coming along. And as always, drive safe, and I will see you at the movies.